and I think we'll get started. Uh, so, uh, hello. Uh, this is, as I said, the Chime sponsor session. Uh, more engineers, more problems, solutions for big teams. I want to welcome, all, welcome you all here, and thank you for spending a slice of your conference time with us at Chime. Um, my name is Noel Rappin. I am a staff engineer at Chime. My team name is literally iHeartRuby, uh, and I'm responsible for some of the Ruby practice and internal uh, Ruby community building and, and some other infrastructure within Chime. Uh, I did want to call out, so we have th we're going to have we're here from three Chime engineers today, but we have a bunch of Chime engineers in the room. So if the other Chime, all the Chime engineers in the room here today could stand up just quickly. We have, uh, a, there are more of us here. <laughs> there are more of us here wearing Chime shirts, but if you have questions about Chime or Chime engineering and you see one of us, and there's another one in the back walking in now. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so. I'm going to start this off by sharing what I think of as being one of the most terrifying graphics that I know of as somebody who cares about software teams and how software gets built. And it is not a latency graph, and it's not mean time to failure, and it's not even a big, huge, well, it's not even a, a, a mean time, a, a list of our errors or anything like that. The, the most terrifying graph that I know of is simply this. And this is just a very abstract sort of network graph. You can think of the, the vertices of this as people for our purposes, but you can also think of them as systems. And what this shows here is that uh, your amount of possible communication paths goes up super linearly as your team grows. So you start off with three people, and there's three potential lines of communication. By the time you get to 14 people, there's 91 potential lines of communication. And this is sort of the numerical proof of something that you have probably all felt, which is that as you get big and as you get big fast, the amount of communication in your organization gets bigger faster. And it always feels like you're catching up. Did I just lose the mic? Okay. It always feels like you're catching up. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. In a related story, Chime Engineering more than tripled in size in 18 months from November 2020 to April 2022. And that came with it a set of challenges that we are going to talk about here today. So I want to tell you a little bit about Chime and about Chime Engineering. Uh, Chime is a financial technology company. It is founded on the premise that basic banking services should be helpful, easy, and free. Um, it's been very gratifying that some people at the conference who are Chime members, or even people at the event staff who are Chime members, have been coming to our booth today uh, over the last couple of days to tell us how much they really appreciate and enjoy our service. Um, Chime members uh, get a uh, essentially a transaction card, a debit card that gives them early access to their paycheck. They have accounts with no monthly fees, fee-free overdrafts, no overdraft fees, and fee-free overdrafts up to $200, and a secured way to use a credit card that helps you build credit without helping you, without causing you to get deeper into debt. So helping our members achieve financial peace of mind with the simplest and low cost and most human financial products. It's very important to us that we profit with our members when our members are successful, not off of our members. Chime is, a, I think, a very mission-driven uh, team in that, in that respect. Chime Engineering has about 600 engineers. Uh, our main offices are San Francisco, Chicago, Vancouver, but we also have a number of people who are full-time remote, including myself. It is mostly Ruby on the back end with a little bit of Go, and our front end is React and React Native. Um, I wouldn't quite call it a microservice architecture, maybe a macro services architecture. Uh, it has a, we have a number of different internal services, many of which are back end only and uh, communicate with the other services via API. Um, and you can go to careers.chime.com uh, to see a list of our career openings. Um, it is a great place to work. It says that we say we're a great place to work, and we really are a great place to work. So I hope that you will follow up with us. Um, but I also want to talk, I want to introduce uh, three people who are going to be talking about some of our big team challenges. We have David Trejo, who's going to talk about how Chime creating, creates a proactive security and engineering culture in the face of this rapid growth. Um, Brian Lesperance is going to talk about observ observability, uh, which is important on a complex, multifaceted system, and also using active support so that each team doesn't have to rebuild, uh, doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And then Chris, Chris Dwan is going to talk about our onboarding process and how we use that to uh, get, have new developers uh, become familiar with Chime's process and Chime's culture, and in particular our Ruby culture. So with that, thank you all for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to David. Morning, everyone. Let's see. Here we go. 
Right, so I'm David. Good to see you all. I am a security engineer on the security engineering team. I've been at Chime for about a year and nine months or so, and I've really been enjoying it. Um, and I'm going to talk about this Rails app that we've been building to help us scale our security across all of our production services. Um, so to give you an example of some of the challenges that we're seeing as a security team, uh, tell me if you've ever gotten a message like this. Raise your hand. Um, when you get a message like this, it, it's very emotional. Uh, I think the security team is really good at sending messages like this, and so is the HR team. Um, so when you get a message like this, you think, OK, like, am I in trouble? And then your next thought is like, well, why didn't anybody tell me that I shouldn't do this? Um, and then also, how do I even resolve these vulnerabilities? And generally, that just makes you feel kind of sad or stressed. Um, so on the security team, we wanted to kind of break that dynamic. And so our strategy is to uh, send a Slack message to the team channel. Um, side note, having a one-to-one -one mapping between your team channel, uh, sorry, between your repository, like production service, and your team channels in Slack is extremely helpful. That way you don't have to like go to an ownership matrix and come back. But anyway, what this message is saying is, hey, like the security score for your service is not what we want it to be. Please do this and this and get it back above a B. So a little bit of context about why we need to do this. Um, as he said, we're growing a ton. That means lots of new services. And the services have security gaps, which we need to fill. Um, security is important for us because uh, people bank with us. And it would be very bad if we lost any of their data. So. Uh, kind of to sum up the problem space, if you're a leader, engineering leader, you can't like see how is the security doing. Um, and then as an engineer, you just don't know what to do to make the security of your production service better. So uh, we kind of set out to improve that. Um, also, as a security team, you've got all these different tools uh, that you buy. Um, and it's just too overwhelming if, as an engineer, somebody has to go look at each of those tools to figure out how to improve their security. Um, then you've got the compliance angle, which is uh, if you don't have a tool, then you've got an engineer going into GitHub like, OK, does this repo have branch protection? Does this one? And you know that could spend like a whole year uh, checking those things across the number of repos that you have. Um, so we built this uh, internal Rails app to help us with that. Um, everyone's familiar with badges on their repositories and gets good attention. Um, so every night, we calculate a grade for the repository, a security grade. And then uh, that badge shows that. And if the engineer wants to know how to make it go up, they can click through. and. Uh, they will see a list of different uh, score factors that they should improve in order to uh, improve their grade. If they click to open up any particular score factor, they can see the instructions uh, down there at the bottom. One of those is expanded. And this has really reduced our audit workload. Um, just to call out a few of the most important uh, score factors, since that text is kind of small. Um, the security team creates approved Docker base images, which they get rebuilt regularly, which resolves most of the vulnerabilities. So we want everyone to use those. Uh, we want everybody to get code reviews. That's kind of self-explanatory. And when the service has vulnerabilities, we want people to resolve those. Um, so here's some of our results. We've got a lovely up and to the right graph. Um, we've tracked more and more score factors, 
and more of our production repositories over time have reached a B or better. Um, so member data has been safeguarded, engineers know what to do, and leaders can see the security investments paying off. So if you wanted to build something like this at home, so to speak, at your own company, where would you want to start? So in the security realm, you just kind of think, where does engineering interact with security? And like, where do we want to build some tooling to help with that? So a great start for your MVP is just like a cron job that hits some APIs, like say GitHub, and then send Slack messages and can also send uh, reports from that job. Um, Slack messages we found are very effective. And uh, if you, we do want to open source Monocle, although we're not sure when or and haven't made a final decision. Um, but in the meantime, you could check out uh, OSSF's All-Star or Backstage for some similar tooling. And if you have questions, please uh, send us an email, security at Chime, or message me on Twitter at DD Trejo. Uh, this has definitely been my favorite job ever, so please uh, get in touch with us. And next up, we've got Brian. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Lesperance. I'm a software engineer in the in Chime's Risk and Support Engineering Group. I'm going to share a story about developing secure and observable software with active, active support. For any team, it's important to balance development speed with security. And as teams grow, it's important to balance autonomy with consistency amongst teams. Now, let's imagine we're in a growing engineering organization. We've encapsulated logic into their own objects, like you see here, this particular uh, mission critical piece of our code base. Uh, however, we have heard from upstream consumers, stakeholders, that there's an issue. It could be anything from returning wrong results. Um, it could be slowing down. It could be crashing. How would you go about debugging this, diagnosing this? Um, I bet a lot of you would probably take a fairly traditional scientific approach. Measure, learn, and build. Well, in this case, fix. Um, but that raises a tactical question. How should we measure this? Uh, we likely don't have perfect instrumentation on every feature that we have, um, so we'll likely have to add it, especially in this case. In the past, I have definitely wrapped code in question in something and some timing and logging code like this. You, you all probably have done something very similar. This works, but it could use a little bit of drying up uh, to be a little bit more reusable. And Rails has a few libraries that are especially useful to accomplish this. Active Support Notifications is an instrumentation API uh, that is built into Rails. It's how Rails measures requests, tracks queries in order uh, to log them. So let's take advantage of this to take a fairly Rails-centric uh, approach to this problem. Active Support Notifications takes a published subscription approach, pub sub approach to instrumenting uh, code, meaning that there are two pieces that are involved in this. One is to measure the code in question. And you see here wrapping any code that you want to, to instrument. And the other, uh, something like this, will be the um, will take the measurement uh, and be able to log it or do whatever it is you, you please with it, be it to send it to a metrics tool, uh, anything that your heart desires. So this library is helpful for separating the instrument instrumentation code from our own business logic. Um, the pub sub pattern that it takes internally helps decouple as well the logic of measuring the code under question as well as presenting it in the way that you want, that, that nice separation of concerns. Uh, it also lays the groundwork for further improvements and uh, reuse, uh, upstreaming it perhaps to a, an application service object if you so choose. So looking at our naive approach, we went from explicitly measuring to something like this, where we are implicitly measuring through the library um, and it also will track other things that are just as important, such as object allocation and a number of other things. So let's take a look at how we present this information, uh, what we're using it for. Uh, we have been explicitly logging it like this. Um, now we need to consume the example that we saw previously. Right? Uh, it might look something like this. Uh, fairly straightforward 
uh, call to monotonic subscribe. There used to be a subscribe method, but this is a little more, uh, it's nicer to, to use the monotonic clock uh, for purposes of, of dealing with potential skew and uh, just wall clock changes over time. You know, I, I wonder where this might live, though. Uh, should this be an initializer? Uh, it feels funny to me, though, because there, there might be presentation logic um, that might be important to test. There might be some complexity in it. If you've ever taken a look at act, the way Active Record does its logging, it has quite a bit of presentation logic that's very helpful for us. So uh, wh where should we put this? Fortunately, Rails has a solution for that. Uh, act so action support, Active Support logger, Log Subscriber is a library that is meant for consuming active, active, action support, <laughs> wow, active support notifications events in order to log them. This is a parent class used by a number of Rails libraries for such purposes. Uh, action Controller, action, Active Record uses it to, excuse me, to log requests and uh, queries, respectively. There are a few important pieces to this equation, but this is a simple example of it. Um, the, the first two are related. The attach to uh, class method and the instance method in here uh, are, are named in a very specific way. Um, you may have been noticing that I've been using the, the label when running the instrumentation code uh, called dot Fibonacci. That was very intentional because in this context, Fibonacci is essentially a namespace, even though it's coming at the end, um, which might seem a little strange. And then called in particular is, you can sort of think of that as an event. The documentation doesn't really call it out like that, um, but that is how it is being used. So it can be a little bit confusing, but it can really help uh, if you're doing more instrumentation within a single library that you want to coalesce the, the logging into a single spot. And the, the last thing that I'll point out about this example is this call to info, this invocation to info. Um, Active, support logger, uh, Active support log subscriber creates a few helper methods that are similar to some of the log methods that you may be familiar with. It essentially delegates to a set logger underneath and Rails will automatically initialize that to the Rails logger. Um, I'm, you may see at the bottom, I'm calling to JSON. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar people are with structured logs. If you use Heroku, they do something similar. It's just sort of a, a quick and easy way to accomplish that. So this approach is helpful because it allows us to follow a sort of internal pattern that Rails has already established. It consolidates the presentation, uh, which can be even more helpful uh, the more related events that start getting uh, instrumented. It also cuts down in a few characters uh, if you don't want to be calling Rails logger all the time, so that's always helpful. So if what we're logging, though, is sensitive information, we have to be careful about logging it. It's a liability to both our users and to our business. Uh, logs have been used in breaches before. Uh, they have in the past, and they will be in the future. So we need to be careful when we handle this information. Um, you know, we want, to, we want to log information to give us intelligence into what's going on when investigating issues. Uh, but we need to not log it in the first place. So the last library I'll bring up with regard to this is uh, Active Support Parameter Filter. It allows you to replace sensitive data from hash-like objects, so that way uh, you don't have to worry about that leaking anywhere that you don't want it to go. Uh, you may have noticed it, uh, but it also is doing some hard work for request logging as well. Uh, anytime that you've seen the filtered message, that is the, the default filtered message, which is configurable. So adding that to our log subscriber uh, might lead us to this right here. It's a, it's a little bit noisy, so I'll try to call out a few important pieces, right? Um, we'll initialize, initialize a list of sensitive fields, sensitive keys. Uh, Rails already has something like this, so we could reuse that. I'm just using a simple example here. Uh, we'll instantiate a new filter with that list of sensitive keys, and we'll let it do the hard work of recursively filtering anything that it finds. And there's some, uh, uh, some really helpful um, approaches to actually uh, specifying particular nested fields if you don't want to let it recursively find keys. So this is great. We have sanitized our hash, and we can even reuse Rails' list of sensitive keys. I'd say that's mission accomplished. Uh, to sort of reiterate what we've gone through today, active support notification is what's measuring our code, log subscriber consumes that data, and parameter filter is what's sanitizing it before we log it. Uh, we don't have to stop here. Perhaps we want to go a little bit further, extract it to a parent service or even to a, a library, um, and use it throughout our application and throughout our organization. Uh, we might want to send this instrumentation somewhere else aside from logs, perhaps a metrics tool. Regardless of what you do, I really hope that knowing a little bit more about active support will inspire you 
uh, and your curiosity. Uh, one thing I'll leave you with real fast is a book recommendation. Who doesn't love tech books, right? Uh, Crafting Rails for Applications. This book was very uh, important to me. It inspired me uh, when I was becoming a software developer and gave me the curiosity and confidence to start exploring internals of libraries, especially Rails. Uh, Jose Vermeulen works through several examples in here that are, are really helpful in a similar vein. It was written in 2014 against Rails 4, as you can see. I think it holds up really well, you know, minus the MongoDB parts, but uh, I, I actually kid about that. So I'll leave you there, and thank you so much for your attention, and uh, let me introduce Chris. When the iPhone came out, it changed uh, everything. It was transformational. And Ruby and Rails are also transformational ideas. In fact, when I discovered a little project called InSticky by DHH around 19 years ago, it changed me. And when Rails was released, I quit my job as a father with two young kids and risked everything to pursue it. These are the actions of a crazy person. <laughs> or maybe someone in love. Uh, but what does this have to do with onboarding? Well, I'm here to talk about what we learned while developing an onboarding session to introduce people to Ruby and Rails. Now, we've had hundreds of people come through our sessions in the past year, and I'd love to share some of the things that we learned. But first, why is onboarding so important? Well, maybe you've, been ex you've experienced being handed a laptop and a pat on the back on your first day. Or maybe you've al also experienced uh, a lengthy the onboarding session. Uh, so, so, so you probably know how important this is to get first impressions right. And at Chime, we need a consistent and effective onboarding program so that we can reduce the burden on hiring managers and get people up to speed quickly, or else hiring can become a huge drag on teams. Uh, sorry, I'm. And at Chime, we were hiring people with Rails experience, so we really needed to introduce people to Ruby and Rails in a way that might lead to love and a good relationship with these great ideas. Because we all know what happens in a bad relationship. There's arguing and fighting. But in a bad relationship with Rails, it leads to bad code. Uh, so the first question that we have really is, where did I begin in developing these sessions? Well, the first thing I did was to create an initial version of the onboarding session and just get started because we had a great need for it. But as soon as humanly possible, I got someone to partner with me on it. When I brought Jeff onto the team, I gave him full ownership. I showed him what I was doing in the sessions and handed it over to him to run the next session. He updated the slides. He added his own code ideas, his own ideas to the slides, got rid of some of my bad ideas. Uh, but then he created a GitHub repo with code examples and added a lot of consistency and improvements to the session. Uh, but what's really important about this is uh, it made it sustainable. I couldn't do it alone. I would burn out, and I'd have a hard time taking vacation. Uh, and I wanted to build something that would continue to benefit Chime over the long term. So now it was sustainable. We could focus on improving the content. Uh, and we found this is, a, this is a challenging balance. So we, if we give too many concrete details, then, uh, sorry, if we give too many uh, abstract details, then uh, becomes people gave us feedback that the sessions weren't useful. But if we give too many concrete details, then it becomes overwhelming, boring, and people forget what they hear. And we had people of different backgrounds and experience coming through, so it's tricky to balance. How do we scope this effectively? Uh, so how do we balance all that? Well, one fateful Thursday when Jeff went on holidays, I took over the session and I stumbled upon an idea. I was going through Jeff's improved slides and I realized that I didn't know what I was going to say on the slides, so I cheated. I decided to turn it into a game for the participants where they would drive the session by asking questions about the slides. Uh, and this actually turned out really well. It was a lot of fun and way better than being a talking head over Zoom for an hour. So we started to refine these sessions around this new concept. And this is how we run our Ruby session, our intro to Ruby session now. First, we welcome people, and then we give them an IRB session immediately so that they can tinker and play. 
and then we briefly talk about the philosophy of Ruby, why Chime uses Ruby, and then the main event is the question game uh, where we put up slides with some basic Ruby code, and these are sequentially leading people through uh, different concepts of Ruby, but we put up the slides and we say, okay, your job, we'll make it a little bit of a game. You get points for asking questions, you get points for answering questions. We don't track the points super well, but it emphasizes what we're after here. And so people start looking at the slides and asking questions, and then we can just lead the session. Uh, and then we end it all with a mob programming exercise where people build some Ruby, uh, working Ruby together using test-driven development. If you're interested in exactly how we run this question game and uh, the session, I'm planning to post it on the Chime blog, but please reach out to me. My contact information will be at the end. But then why does the question game work? Well, I have some ideas. Firstly, as Stephen Kotler says, curiosity is free focus. If we can get people curious, then they become engaged and they're able to absorb more ideas. Secondly, by encouraging everyone to answer questions, it removes the limitations on the, the presenter uh, and other people can ask quest answer questions that participants might have. And then thirdly, it uses a concept I learned from Jessica Kerr, which is in her systems thinking workshop, which is pull, don't push. When we try to push information on people, it's hard. Just ask my kids. Uh, but if people are drawn into curiosity and ask for what they need, then it becomes easy. So sometimes these sessions have gone better than others. So your next question might be, well, how do you run them effectively? Well, here's some uh, things that I've learned along the way. People get people's hands dirty actually using the tools. Probably the big thing I'd emphasize is engage two-way communication right away. I find that what I need to do is I arrive early. When people come, I welcome them by name. And then early in the session, we don't do the go around and introduce yourself. I find it doesn't work very well. But what does work well is to ask people how much Ruby experience do they have and what are they hoping to get out of the session. If I just do that, it greatly increases the chance that later on in the session, people engage, ask questions, and be involved. Also, we need to allow empty space. We put up slides. We have to allow them just to be silently reading, which is really hard to do as a presenter. You want to you know, throw in some ideas, but allow that empty space to be there. Keeping it moving can be challenging. It requires a skill to get through the slides. Um, and then also splitting the Ruby and Rails sessions into two so they can both breathe is another thing that we learned. All right, uh, if you want a front row seat for the onboarding sessions to see how it goes, you know what to do. Uh, okay, uh, overall, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful to Matts and DHH for their great ideas, which have changed me. I'm grateful to Chime for giving me the opportunity to go on this journey and work with an amazing team. Uh, Jeff and I have grown into a team, and we are working on uh, building a culture of ongoing learning for Ruby and Rails at Chime. And I'm really grateful to you for being here, so thank you for coming. Uh, overall, I think that incremental change is mostly worthless. Transformational change uh, is something that all of our companies are trying to go through, and it's essential to be able to grow. And transformational change cannot happen without love, and love will never happen without a proper introduction. And this is why I think onboarding is so important. Thank you very much.